This is my canopy. What we're going to cover is the overall life cycle of a grant and get into some fairly detailed cost, direct and indirect cost calculations. So that'll probably be the majority of that. One thing that, that we will not necessarily do, though, is, is deal with donation or fundraising processes. So the, this topic or this webinar is going to be focused more on the concept of you are applying for, let's say, a federal grant. Uh, then you receive or are awarded that grant, and then you have to track all of your expenses related to the grant, as opposed to going out and getting, let's say, a thousand small donations and trying to manage um, uh, fundraising events. Uh, just to clarify exactly what we're going to be focusing on, which is more the uh, traditional grants life cycle. And so we'll start out with that. Then we'll jump into what's called cost recovery. How do I recoup all of the expenses that are related to grants? And that's going to be related to budgeting. And how do I establish a budget uh, for a grant? What are, their typical, what are some of the typical expense categories that we need to deal with there? And then we'll look at a specific type of cost recovery called effort reporting. And this is more oriented towards higher education or research types of grants, where you have to certify the amount of effort that your employees are providing on a grant. And so that may or may not apply to your organization. And then we'll also take a look at matching grants, or sometimes that's called cost sharing. And then finally, subawards, or that's also called pass-through or outbound grants. And I think I've seen grants in the uh, chat already about being able to uh, provide grants. And then, so what are the typical life cycle or the process there? So a little bit of background about Piango. Uh, we were founded in 2012 with a focus of building applications on top of the NetSuite platform. And so what that means uh, is that we are 100% integrated with NetSuite. We have the same database, the same security model, and the same user interface for our applications. We provide a full grant accounting application as well as budget control or encumbrance accounting. <clears throat> and I'll touch a little bit on the encumbrance accounting later on when we get into the budgeting uh, costs. So at a high level, this is what we're gonna cover. But one thing I wanna really focus on is the automation aspect right up front about this issue of currently manually tracking things or getting out of Excel and moving into a cloud-based or an ERP-based system. And in so doing, that, and once up, that's step one of that process to get away from a completely manual process. But then we want to be able to automate some of these activities as far as maybe when audit uh, or report deadlines are coming up, automate reminders for that, automate the process of calculating your direct and indirect costs, automate the linkage between, say, an inbound grant and an outbound grant. So that's what I'm going to focus on today uh, throughout the presentation. So let's dig into the life cycle. The traditional approach, and this is, again, more a little bit more on the research type of things, but it does apply for uh, just general, say, community-based nonprofits because you're always on the look for additional funding sources. Other types of awards that might become available either at the state level, the federal level, or potentially the uh, uh, from other foundations. And so your development organization is out there looking for those types of really revenue sources, if you will. And so there's a process there of searching for or at least creating what would be called a draft grant award. Then you might go through an approval process. So for example, I've worked with a transit agency in the past and they would identify potential funding opportunities for their operations. And they would then create that as a draft proposal. It would need to be approved internally uh, from the award or, uh, or within the organization. And then, of course, they would submit a full package to the funding organization that would either be, say, state or federal funding. Then that would become awarded from the granting or the donor organization and then donor agency. And then once that occurs, then you would set up various terms and conditions or costing rules for that particular grant. And uh, so then 
all of that data, especially if you have various contracts that are associated with the grant, that should be attached to the grant in your ERP system and not just necessarily sitting on someone's laptop. And so you want to make sure all the official documentation is stored alongside the grant. And then you may allocate grants to projects or to uh, programs of, of different types. So again, different organizations either run several projects that are related to a grant. And so that's where the activity occurs, or maybe they have certain programs uh, that are established that are kind of ongoing, long running programs of really how they accomplish their mission, but they want to attach the grant to those programs. So then when you do that, of course, it, it impacts your financials because you, you might have several grants that are funding a particular program. And then finally, we may close out a grant and you want to make sure any existing transactions in the system are closed out. So for example, if you have an open purchase order, maybe that just needs to be closed or maybe the goods need to be ordered, received, expensed. And then at that point, you can close out your grant. So there's even details on just uh, saying we get to the end. It's not just that the date goes by and you're done processing. There could be follow-on activity for the grant. Usually that's taken care of during a period closing process, but it could be separate from that because sometimes it could be up to 90 days after the grant actually is completed where you're still collecting expenses against that grant. And the rules will differ from grant to grant and from donor to donor on how up or how late you can apply that. Now, related to this life cycle, so what, I'm, what I just talked about is, or the accounts receivable side of things, it's the inbound grants. Some organizations also have what are called pass-through grants. And so in that case, you're going to, you're going to allocate this funding and then provide that as additional or funding for another organization to execute that. I've run into this in, uh, with international NGOs where they may be what's called the prime recipient for a grant that is being awarded by say the US federal government. And then they will contract with a local agency to go implement that grant. So they are basically paying a agency, let's say in Africa or in India to go implement that grant. And so they're passing the revenue that they've received from the federal government into these other organizations. And then they may go through a selection process. So that's what we call uh, at Piango a sub award. So it is a same kind of setup where, where you would establish which programs and initiatives are available for funding, promote those opportunities, receive applications, or sometimes those are called letters of inquiry that of other organizations that are interested in receiving funds. Then you would grant the award to that grantee, disperse the funds through your AP system, and then track expenses. So you have a whole life cycle on that side as well. Typically, when you apply for a grant, you have to fill out an application or maybe send in what's sometimes called as a letter of inquiry. This idea of a grant application, and I like this quote here. I'm not sure exactly where I heard it or picked it up, but if you've seen one application, you have seen one application because the formats of applying for grants is different with every, just about every federal agency, state agencies, foundations, they all want different information to be collected, different statistics about your organization that you have to provide, you know, what other funding do you have uh, con considered, what is number of employees, number of grant administrators, et cetera. So typically you might create an application internally, route that to be approved within your organization that this is money that you want to make an effort to try to be uh, to be awarded especially if you're in higher education applying for a grant takes a lot of effort and so you have to kind of pick and choose ones that you think you're going to qualify for otherwise you spend a lot of time spinning wheels filling out lots of forms but not getting very far once you've identified that particular form, you want to get that or application, you want to get that approved, and then you would submit it. And then finally, it would be awarded uh, back to your organization. And you might have a variety of different status values declined by sponsors. So that'd be a case where I'm, I've submitted it to the organization. 
to the federal agency and we have not received it, right? But I still wanna track that in the system to indicate, yes, we have applied for X number of grants and we've received Y number of awards from that. Now, when we look at some of the details from it within this, and this is where, you know, this will vary from system to system and from uh, organization to organization. Obviously, you're going to be keeping track of who the purpose of the grant, things like that. And you also may come up with a sample budget. And so the idea there is that this may not be a detailed approved operational budget, but it's a planned forecast of expense categories that you might need to. Also, when you put together the proposal, you will want to attach, see notice there's a little attachments tab there. You'll want to be able to store any supporting documentation related to that proposal. This becomes important when you get into auditing process uh, for a grant. The agency will come in and want to see, okay, what, why did you apply for this award? Or when you did, when you received the award, what kind of supporting documentation was available for that? And then once you receive the award, what kind of terms and conditions are a part of that? And they want to see that in one location. So once you are awarded the grant, then we need to do a lot of tracking against that. As I've mentioned before, we have terms and conditions for that grant. We also need to have, when we're viewing the grant, a quick snapshot. Where are we at with respect to total revenues received versus expenses that have been incurred against that grant? And I want to look at that from both the lifetime of the grant, inception to date, and year to date to see where we're at. Because again, maybe inception to date, I'm in good shape, but year to date, I've got more expenses than revenue, and that could be an issue. And then dates. There's going to be lots of dates that we're tracking with respect to grants. Obviously, most grants will have a start and ending period so that your donor or sponsor is going to say, I'm going to give you X number of dollars for fiscal year 22 or fiscal year 23, and that's it. But we also have when are, when are we when are the due dates for applying for a grant? When will the decision date come back? When is the effective date of being able to track expenses against the grant? Things like that. So you, you want to be able to track a lot of the dates. Uh, yes, and some um, uh, person were put in a question about reporting dates. And uh, within Piango, and there's also what I just call generally attributes uh, for a grant. So uh, for federal grants, you have, may have a CF. CFDA number, single audit required checkbox, and lots and lots of other types of attributes. So one thing that if you are in the market for a grants system, uh, you want to make sure that it is configurable or customizable, that you can add in these attributes. So for example, with Piango, we provide some of these basic fields here, but the NetSuite platform allows us to add in any number of other custom fields that can be added for additional tracking purposes for your grants. So that's a nice feature that NetSuite has. Other software applications may or may not have that capability. And then of course, you also wanna keep track of any changes that you have to your grants through an audit trail. So that way, again, you're, when you get audited, they can look back and say, has that grant changed? Has, it, has someone somehow added a, an extra, uh, $50,000 to the grant award, and then you could track that audit. So one thing that uh, Piango does to, to get back to the idea of tracking for report deadlines is we have what's called milestone type. So it's kind of like a, a mini project management for grants. It's definitely not a full Microsoft project capability with Gantt charts and resource allocations and all that, that type of stuff. But what we can do is keep track of, as you can see towards the bottom here, audit reports, project evaluations, financial report deadlines. And then we notify the people that are responsible or the team itself ahead of time that these milestones are coming up. And so, again, this is something that you would want to keep an eye out for that built into the grant itself. You have that capability Instead of, let's say, some systems may have this associated with a project, but a project may not necessarily be a grant. 
And so you want to, in, in a sense, establish these dates or milestones for your individual grants. I mentioned this earlier about when I was going through the high level, but let's get into the details some more on the grant closeout process. And so a key thing is, is you want to make sure all of your purchase orders are either closed out or billed or in the billing pro phase of the, of the procurement process. Also track, have you, have you received all the supplier payments for any outstanding, uh, or sorry, not received, but have you made all of the supplier payments for any outstanding invoices you have, or if you have grantees? So in this case for the sub awards, if you have any sub awards that are tied to the inbound grant and you're closing out the inbound grant, are the sub awards also closed out at that process? And then specifically on the sub award side, you want to make sure that you go through a closeout process with the grantee. So it kind of becomes a, a bit of a ripple effect uh, when working out, working through the close closing process. Again, there may be a grace period to complete any transactions that are post the end date. And that may vary from system to system or possibly even donor to donor. And then one other thing to check is, okay, once I've closed out the grant, I wanna make sure that in the future, I am not able to raise a new purchase order or I'm not able to book, let's say payroll or salary against this particular grant if it's not closed. So that's something that sometimes when you're going through an implementation, you forget to test that little piece to make sure that once the grant closed, you're not continually posting to it because then that'll mess up your finances uh, on the grant when you look at your grant revenue to expense reports. This next section of the presentation will probably be the most complex, at least from a math perspective. So get out your number two pencils, put on your accounting green, uh, green hats with the little green shades on them, and uh, be ready to do some number crunching here because that's our, our next step. So at a high level, grant revenue is uh, the, the, to calculate that, ideally your revenue should equal your expenses, right? So that's your basic formula. Uh, and so in other words, if I apply for an award and I get a million dollars, then the combination of what are called my direct and indirect costs should add up to a million dollars. Right. If if we're truly nonprofit, right, <laughs> we're not making money on our grants. That's that's the base calculation. So we're going to go through some of these in a lot more detail. Notice that there's this little thing over here, this agreed rate that can be challenging sometimes to determine what rate you can charge back for cost reimbursable types of grants. So let's break these down a little bit more, the direct and indirect cost. A direct cost typically is salary, right? That's, that's going to be the bulk of what you're going to be charging back to a grant. But you might have some items. So let's say if I have an organization where I am doing medical training or medical clinics in uh, Central America. Let's say we're going to El Salvador and we've set up clinics and we're going to be doing some sort of uh, operations there. We will have, of course, uh, salary for the people that are directly, you know, the doctors that are providing that service. But we may also have travel expenses for doctors that are traveling, say, from the U.S. to El Salvador to actually do that particular uh, implementation uh, or working at the clinic. Then, of course, we're going to be purchasing bandages, various hospital supplies, hospital beds, whatever, medicines, things like that. So those are direct expenses that we're going to be using in that, uh, in that particular situation. The idea, the general rule is that the direct costs are required to accomplish the grant objectives to meet the award specifications. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Maximum amount of salary to be capped. And that is very common so that you, you have a particular award and you can either cap either indirect costs or direct costs against that. And within that, yeah, you can have a prorata based upon projects and actual salaries. And that gets into a little bit of what's called effort. So yeah, the, the, those are some more complex rules that come into play. Indirect cost is this idea that we have overhead related to the grant. Usually that would be rent or administrative salaries, 
maybe IT services. So you probably have a centralized IT organization and they're providing help to a variety of different grants or maybe non-grant activity, but you wanna be able to charge a portion of their salary or the actual computers, networks, databases, all of that stuff, software licenses, those are all typically overhead that I wanna be able to charge back to the donor in this case. And so this is where we get into the complex calculations to see how do I calculate the indirect cost for that uh, for each particular grant. And it can change on a grant to grant basis. And then there's an alternative model that's called the modifiable total direct cost. So we'll dig into that where the idea there is you create what's called a base amount that's available or allowable for a grant. And then from there, calculate the indirect cost. So let's go into the indirect costs in some detail here. Several different ways of calculating what's called the indirect cost rate. Sometimes you just go with a flat rate, 10% minimum rate, Office of Management and Budget, just can, they have that kind of documented, you can just use that. You might be able to do, to do better if you come up with what's called or negotiate what's called the NICRA, negotiated indirect cost rate. And the idea there is based upon historical grants, or maybe you have an existing grant that's getting extended and we can go back and look at our, our indirect costs, I can then negotiate a better amount than say the 10%. Also, I can apply that NICRA rate to my pass-through grants, to the sub-awards. So if I am receiving a million dollars, but say 400,000 of that is gonna be done by an outside organization, I should be able to leverage, a, I can use a NICRA rate, let's say it's 20%. So I could say of the 400,000 that I'm giving to another organization, 20% of that, which if I do my math right, is $80,000. I should be able to charge as an indirect expense back to my donor. So let's take a look, a deep dive into this NICRA, negotiated indirect cost rate calculation. So you need to identify which is the primary federal agency. Typically, this is all associated with federal granting and identify which is your primary because you might be receiving grants from Department of Education, um, National Institute of Health, what, you know, whatever, several different uh, alphabet related granting organizations. So you identify the primary one. You identify then, okay, based on that, what do they allow for indirect costs? And that what is their methodology? And we're going to talk about a couple of different methodologies next. And then um, we may, uh, especially let's say if we have an extended grant where it's uh, multi-years. So we may say, okay, here's my estimated costs that I'm going to have for the next period, next year. And we may get then a provisional rate for those estimated costs. And so then we would then calculate um, the, uh, and this might be say for six months. So at, after six months, we would calculate our, our indirect cost, submit that and get that audited. And then we may go through a true up process to look at, okay, here's the actual cost based upon what's been defined versus the estimated cost that we had. We'll apply the rate and then determine are we positive or minus, right? Do we owe uh, do we owe more money to the government or less money, right? So we go through that, uh, that true up process. And then after that, then we can say, all right, now we've established the rate, whether it's 25%, 33%, whatever it might be. And so that usually, as you can see here, it, it's a fairly lengthy process to get that indirect rate established. Now, there, if you're not dealing with the federal government, uh, you know, if you're working with a foundation, or whatever, there may be other ways you can calculate this indirect cost. A simple approach is I'm just going to take my indirect cost, divide by direct cost, in this case, 800,000 uh, divided by 2,200,000 2, is a 36% rate. But of course, the challenge is I need to identify what goes into both the numerator and the denominator in this case. Typically, again, your, your indirect components would include any of your administrative costs that benefit the whole organizations. And I talked about IT earlier, but a lot of people here are in the finance department. 
And so all of your salaries and activities and supplies, et cetera, could be considered indirect costs because you're benefiting the whole organization. You may also have shared costs such as facilities. So if you have a lot of uh, community organizations that I've worked with will have their office complex in the same building as say a clinic. And so the clinic itself is sharing the cost or the rent of that facility for the rest of the office. And so that has to be factored in. And then of course I might have the same utility bills or that the electric costs that I have could be allocated out to each grant. I think we've talked about the direct components. So let's, let's move into what's called then allowable expenses. This could be both on the direct and indirect side of things. Uh, but most of the time it's on the indirect. So classic example is you're going out whining and dining uh, the, the sponsor and trying to get your award or you're working with uh, grantees and you're going out to events or traveling or whatever it might be, right? Now I'm exaggerating, of course, there because I know none of you would ever go whining and dining what related to grant expenses. But we typically cannot expense alcohol, right? That's a, a fairly standard uh, excluded expense item. But there may be certain other types of travel that may not be included, certain administrative costs that you may not be allowed to book to your uh, grants. And that could vary on a grant by grant basis. So we're seeing in the lower left here is actually a Piango screen where we can identify based upon the GL account code, whether that expense is allowable or not for a particular grant. Then that's used when we start to calculate the indirect cost numbers. But I could break it out either by cost center, by funding type, whether it's restricted, unrestricted, et cetera. Okay, so now let's go through an example here of calculating that, that 36% that I kind of gave on a previous uh, slide. And so this one, we, we kind of read this spreadsheet here from right to left. So we've got, let's say the three awards, let's say these are federal awards and then some non-federal award that might be out there. And so the sum of these awarded amount um, or these costs, and actually I should say these are the, uh, not the award amounts, but the individual costs for these awards. So we have 2.2 million of total direct costs. So that's the sum of all of the things on the right-hand side that are in orange. Then, I have what are called allowable indirect costs resulting in, uh, or, and these are all salaries, resulting in a $2.6 million salary amount. Okay, does that make sense? We've got total direct salaries plus some indirect salaries resulting in 2.6. The next line item is just other expenses. So these would be my, typically my, uh, could be direct supplies or things like that that I'm purchasing for these grants. And so I've got 1.4 million in the total direct cost, then 360,000 of some indirect expenses. And then I've got 10,000 that would be unallowable for whatever reason. Now the total cost includes everything. You know, so from your internal financials, you still are incurring 1.8 million of other expenses for a total of 4.45 million of overall cost. But we can, of course, charge back the 10,000 here as unallowable or because they are unallowable. So now if I take a look at my allowable indirect cost in blue here, so removing that 10,000, I have 800,000 of the total indirect cost. I divide that by this other blue item, that's the total direct cost or direct salaries in this case, because I'm only gonna factor in, let's say salaries, I end up with my 36% rate, okay? So hopefully that math all makes sense, the way we were able to calculate that. So the next step that I could do is figure out, okay, what's the indirect impacts to individual grants? So using that 36% amount, I can then refactor this out, this line in yellow here, to say that I had indirect expenses of, say, 213 against award number one, or again, total would be 800,000. So now I can kind of reallocate that back out. Then I can figure out what is the the, the allowable direct and indirect is this next row down here. 
But again, internally, the last step here is I want to add back in the booze cost or the uh, the unallowable cost. So again, my total impact is the 4.45 million. What I could potentially charge back to the donor would be more the either the item in yellow, because uh, that would be the rate that I could charge back cost reimbursable purposes. Okay. So that, that is one kind of direct or, or relatively simple calculation, right? So I end up with identifying my indirect cost divided by direct cost that gets me my cost rate, which then I can allocate back out to each individual grant and then get reimbursed on that. Another approach is to use what's called a pooling effect, where using a, you know, the NICRA rate that we talked about earlier, I add in all of my direct costs into a pool. And from there, I just multiply the direct cost times my indirect cost rate to calculate the indirect amount. Validate that against the cap for each grant. Because we had met, someone had asked that question before about, oh, what about uh, caps against the for indirect costs? So if we're under the cap, well, then we could generate an invoice to get reimbursed. Once we go over that cap, we no longer can collect any indirect costs. And so invoices could be generated on a monthly or quarterly basis. And, and this is where you want to look for automation, especially if you want to try to recoup that on a monthly basis, because you want to be generating invoices for all of your grants, let's say, as part of your period end process. So again, this is another approach of being able to use a pooled direct amount and then from there back out your indirect cost and rate. Then we get into what's called the modified total direct cost. And this is a somewhat newer method that the federal government is uh, either mandating or recommending to be used. And the concept here is that you have a base amount that you can charge against a grant. Typically, again, these are all your um, direct costs. And then if you do have subawards, you have what are called the first 25,000 of that sub grant or subcontract uh, can be charged. So anything over 25,000, you're not able to recoup that from the direct expenses. So again, in, in this process here, we may exclude a capital expenditure or some other organization exp uh, specific expenses or anything that's specific to the grant terms. Then we have a couple of methods to figure out, okay, what is that modified total direct cost? And so the first approach says, if I'm not really sure of the exact budget that I'm going to be working with, I take my total direct cost and then subtract out the indirect exempt cost and the IDC times the IDC rate. And then that gets me my modified total direct cost that I can get reimbursed. Method two says, okay, I know what my budget amount or my award amount is. And so I'm going to go, go through this particular formula here to figure out what the modified total direct cost is. So next, I'm going to go through an example of that. So we have the whether each of these expense categories are eligible or not. So in this case, my capital outlay is not eligible. So I'm going to back that out of my total. So I have my base is now going to be 367 instead of 397. And from there, I'm going to um, be able to apply my rate. So this is my negotiated rate, 28%. And so my actual costs here are going to be 102,000. So 20.28 times the 367. Okay. And then at that point, I can add that back in to get back to my total award amount. So let me back up here just a second. What I'm saying is I had a bunch of expenses, right, for 397. I need to back out the unallowable or the capital outlay. So I really have 367,000 that's remaining. And then from there, I can add in, uh, I can calculate my indirect cost 102, and then I get back up to 500,000. But I do, in this case, I have to, uh, I can't recoup the capital outlay, but that's still considered part of my budget, the 30,000. So hopefully that made sense going through that kind of step-by-step -step process. And so the missing number we were trying to get to is basically the, the 102 and the 500,000. 
the next method uh, where the budget or the award amount is known, I need to find out these question marks. So here, the total award is 500,000 and or my total budget. I know uh, or I budgeted how much salaries, benefits, supplies, et cetera, I'm gonna be calculating. But what I don't know is some of these other miscellaneous expenses and my indirect cost charge that I can apply. So what I will do, and it's a little bit more complicated, is uh, let's say I subtract out uh, some rental costs and capital outlay. So these would be unallowable. Notice that they're not eligible up here. So I'm then working with the base 478,000 plus the indirect cost. So I'm kind of, again, I don't know what that number is right now, but I'm just saying, okay, I've got 478 left after I subtract out the 22,000. Now, from there, what I can do is divide by the indirect cost rate of 28%. I do know that number, but the, the 1.28, so this is now gonna give me my indirect cost base the 373. So based upon what's allowable up here, divided by that 1.28 number gives me the base amount. And then from there, I can calculate my indirect cost amount, which is 104,000. So 28% of the 373 number. Once I've got that, I can plug the uh, numbers back into the question marks to say, all right, I've got 104,000 of my indirect cost. That's what I can charge to this grant. And the, and the missing amount is 117. So right, if I add up all these other numbers and subtract from 500, I get 117 for my miscellaneous expenses. So I can just kind of back into that amount. So those are two different ways I can do the uh, modified or uh, to calculate modified total direct cost. And so that kind of leads into the next topic, which is budgeting. So budgeting, this is, of course, a really important part. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of an iterative process. We don't necessarily calculate all of our indirect costs and then do our budgeting, right? We have to figure out the budget to then drive what we expect to have for our direct and indirect cost areas. Uh, but it is important to be able to break out a budget on a grant basis, so again, some of you that might be in, say, the FP&A team or in finance, you're used to creating an operational budget for the entire organization, but it may not be broken down into or allocated to specific grants. In the budgeting area, the obvious categories are salaries, fringe benefits. I didn't talk about that too much on the indirect costs but the, or the direct costs is any fringe benefits should be factored into your direct cost calculations. So therefore should also be part of your budgeting and uh, in a variety of other categories. And you also need to look at how do you break out the expense category into potential different GL account buckets? And that can be kind of tricky on that. So for example, I might have office supplies. Office supplies could be four or five different categories of either maybe even office-based rental or uh, computer equipment or tr you know, traditional office supplies, paper, paper clips, things like that, right? And so those could be different GL accounts, but they all are just considered office supplies. And then you might need to subdivide into other areas. So for a particular grant, maybe you have different departments providing input or working against that grant. And so you want to be able to track that information. And so that gets into when you're looking at a budgeting tool, what type of granularity do they support? At the highest level, it would be typically your subsidiary or business unit, your business entity. And so for larger nonprofits, you may have several different business entities that you are tracking financials for. Then you would break that down to the grant level, or sometimes that's called a funding source. Funding sources could be restricted, unrestricted, temporarily restricted, or time restricted. So each of those could be different budget categories. And then we have the department or cost center from that point, potentially broken down into location, and then finally GL account. Some of these may not always be present when you're establishing your budget, but all of those becomes uh, a dimension in your budget planning tool. So if you have, say, multiple grants from a single donor, you might need to do a budget to actual for the entire the sum of all of those grants. 
most of the time it may be more one-to-one -one, or you just want to break it out on a grant by grant basis to show here are all of my different expenses that I have. What was my budget? What is the actual for this particular quarter? What's the variance? And then what's my year to date? So that's a standard budget to actual report. But the key thing is, is it's not just for the entire organization or the operational budget. It's going to be what is specific to a grant. And then again, depending on details you want to get or how close you need to track to your grants, um, you may want to enforce real-time checks. So you're not allowed to go over budget. You know, when they received funding, let's say they, I remember once they had a hybrid bus grant. So they were actually building elect, diesel electric buses and they were not allowed to charge anything. You know, they, they had the allowable and unallowable expenses. So if they created a purchase order for a set of parts or let's say bus seats, it had to be specific for that grant and they were not allowed to go over budget for the bus seats that they were installing on the various uh, buses that they had, uh, that they replaced. Let's say that they were doing maintenance on bus seats, something like that. And so they were not allowed to go over budget for that particular GL account, grant, department, combination. And so you wanna uh, be able to protect against that. What we're looking here is, is the Piango budget control solution where we will block the user from being able to go over budget. We may allow them to go over budget when they save the transaction, but then you would route that using workflow. So again, NetSuite has some good workflow capabilities. SAP, Microsoft Dynamics, I think they all have the same, same general capability to route purchase orders for approval. And in this special case here, if the grant exists, we want to be able to route that, say, to the grant manager or the principal investigator. That's another term for the owner of the grant. And then they could either approve or reject the purchase order at that point. So that's something to look for when you're doing budgeting and enforcing the budget throughout the grant lifetime. Let's talk about effort reporting. And this concept is important primarily in the higher education area, but I think if you're doing other education-related grants. So the basic idea is that if you have people that are working on a grant and their salary is directly supported by the grant, you want to report or verify that the effort that they're working meets those terms, meets the percentages that have been specified in the grant award. And so you would say typically on a six month basis, do calculate the total period salary, identify sponsored versus non-sponsored. Because again, maybe a person is, I'll use an example of a uh, professor at a university, they may be doing research 40% of the time and then allocated in their, in their actual salaries being funded by the grant for 40%. The other 60% is teaching or doing service work for the university. And so that 60% is non-sponsored funding. And so then that's what gets counted against the grant and be qualified as effort specific to that grant. So then for that effort amount, that's where you need to actually uh, do the recording. Let's say I have my base salary is 200,000 for that, but there's a salary cap that I can actually apply. So you have a couple of people that are uh, required to track the information. And that's fairly common where you can, you can track the day, track the information. Maybe it comes up in an audit, but you don't have to submit it back to the federal government. Okay. So let's go through this example here. I have 185,000 that is allowed. That's my cap for this particular employee. So that means they're 14,000 or almost 15,000 over, over the cap amount. And then on the project or the grant, I have uh, 10%. So then it's 10% of the 185, not the 200. So that's the salary that I can charge directly to the project or the grant. The 10% that is out of the 49,000 could be a cost sharing part that could be picked up with another award or just consumed by the university. Okay. So typically uh, in, in systems, this is actually a PeopleSoft screenshot that we're looking at. So I don't know if, if anybody's still running PeopleSoft out there, but you would enter in your salary and have it broken out or distributed based upon different projects or grants that you are working on. 
and then uh, from there be able to calculate your sample effort. And then the employee would come along and check the box to say, okay, this project has been certified and we're submitting that. And usually there's a kind of a formal sign off that would be that's done online so that the principal investigator or the faculty logs in and says, yes, I worked on this particular project, the MOU project here and checked it off. I get the, the uh, pop-up, press certify and save. So I now have an electronic audit that this person has worked a certain number of percentage on that particular grant. And so again, depending on the type of donor uh, or grant that you're in, this may become very important for other, other types of uh, organizations that would be less important. So Piango has a similar process where we can capture. So in this case here, I've got uh, the grant award and then the sub tab is saying, okay, I've got all of these people are working a certain amount of percentages and notice that we have that effective data. So a person could roll on and roll off a grant on a period to period basis. And so based on those effective dates, we're going to track how much effort they're committed, and then on the capture, we'll then update that information. We'll talk about grant matching or cost sharing next. So the basic idea here is that you will be given an award, but that's conditional based upon finding other types of funding. Those could be through other grants. So you're matching up donor B with donor A, or it could be gift in kind amounts where you have either donations that are coming in, or maybe you have pro bono services, such as maybe uh, financial audit services or legal services that are being donated to be able to work on the grant. And so then that, that could be considered a match, or you could have internal funding. And so you just have a pool of funding that's available, and then you allocate from that pool to these particular grants. So different ways you can do the cost sharing. So typically that could be 20 to 100%. Reason you want to do this is, is you want to be able to increase your donor base, right? You want to say, I've got a lot more donors because people are coming in and working with each other to fund a particular initiative. And sometimes you may also be running into a situation where the donor doesn't want to be fully responsible for a particular program. And it becomes their program, in a sense, to keep it going. And so they want to be able to show that, hey, there's, you know, in case we're not able to meet this level of funding in the future, do you have other people that might be able to pick up the slack? So that may be a, a side reason on why to do this. Of course, there are a lot of rules. If you have federal grants, then the other sources have to be verifiable. They're typically not included on other federal awards for those funding sources and that they are needed for that particular program objective. So those are some requirements they would have. Unrecovered indirect costs then could be also charged to the matching grant. And so in other words, if again, back to that whole indirect cost calculations we were doing, maybe there's some unrecovered indirect costs. So those need to be shuffled off or applied to the matching grant or the internal funding. And then you have to, again, figure out what is a gift in kind? What's the fair market value? So in other words, let's say back to that example in El Salvador, we're running a clinic. Maybe we have a vehicle that has been donated for use by the clinic to go out into the countryside to do doctor visits. So that vehicle, what is the worth of that vehicle as part of the donation? And it might have depreciation costs. So you have to figure out the fair market value to then indicate that that's a cost sharing aspect. And then we have to figure out what are the various labor rates. So if I have a lawyer that's working for me and I'm based, let's say, in, uh, in Iowa, that labor rate may be different than a New York City based lawyer. Don't make any judgment calls about lawyer, lawyers and legal fees there, but uh, you, uh, hopefully you get the idea. So looking back at the chat here, it looks like most people do, are not doing cost shares. There's a few uh, that are in the B range, like the one to five. I guess we have one organization that's doing a lot of cost sharing. So hopefully, uh, again, what we're talking about here would be applicable. And you want a system that can automate that process. So let's say in this example, we're going to look at the gift in kind process. Let's say we have like a girls and boys club 
community nonprofit, and they're doing an after-school program for kids and then our junior high school kids. And we are required to do a 20% match of 600,000. So we need to come up with 120,000 in order to receive the $600,000 grant. So what we can do is use the space that is provided by the school as our gift in kind. So let's estimate that we're going to run this program 2.5 or two and a half hours per day, five days a week, 40 days throughout the year. So for a total of 200 hours, again, hopefully the math works out there. So we need, you know, it's kind of our hourly total that we're going to deal with. So if we were going to rent out the gym, it might be $100 an hour times 2.4 times 200 days. So we have $50,000. We may use the football field as well. So that's another 50,000 lunchroom and and then maybe the media center. And so we have these different amounts. So so each day we're going to be using these facilities. The school is giving us permission to use the facilities so that can be considered a gift in kind. And so the total, add those up, 175,000. That's greater than the 120 that's needed. So we're covered. We can document that we have cost sharing or matching going on for this particular grant. So this is kind of a checklist that when you're going through the grant matching process, you might want to be able to look at and identify, you know, have you done these calculations? Have you figured out the amounts, et cetera? So the Piango Grants product, the way it looks here is that I'm looking at a particular grant. So in this example, I'm matching, I have a grant that's called the Wounded Warrior Research Grant. So we're looking at various medical disabilities encountered by veterans. We have a match grant that's called the Homeless Wounded Warrior Grant, and we're matching that at a 25% up to a $20,000 cap amount. So we can use that cost sharing to apply to this particular Wounded Warrior Grant. In the detail, then, I can look at which specific transactions, in this case, these are vendor bills, what the original amounts were, and then what would be the matched amount from the homeless wounded warrior. So basically we're saying, I'm not sure if the percentages work out exactly here. I might might have changed the percentages, but I had $250 from the original amount and wounded warriors is paying 187 of that amount. Actually, that would be 75%. So it could be that I flipped the percentages around. Um, But hopefully again, you get the idea that we're able to track the matched amount that would be applied to the other to this other grant. So our last topic is subawards or outbound grants, a variety of different names, outbound pastor grants, foundation grants. And so one thing you probably learned in today's topics is that we have a lot of naming conventions that pop up, a lot of terminology that's used. So in this situation, the organization is the grantor or the donor. And the recipients are the grantees. They're receiving the funding. And so typically we have to look at how do you identify and select the recipients? And then how do you manage the expenses and make payments? So when we identify the recipients, there's two general approaches. One is that you would partner and you know ahead of time. So the example there, I'll go back to uh, international NGO the NGO might be applying for a federal grant. They already know who they're going to be working with in Africa or in India. And so they include those organizations as part of the grant application process. Then they get awarded and then they take the pass-through money that they've received, that 400000 and they'll pass that down to the organization that is local in India or in Africa, right? And so that's one fairly common process in that to be able to identify them. In other cases, maybe the prime uh, or the prime donor does not know who the grantees are, but you already know ahead of time that you're going to be working with them more directly. Then the other approach is more along the lines of a foundation where you have a funding opportunity. You say, hey, I want to promote clean water in a particular area, or I want to promote education opportunities and learning how to become accountants in El Salvador, let's say. And so would then promote that. And then people would apply online for that grant for the awards. And then you you would rank and evaluate that. 
We do have the ability to rank and identify funding opportunities. So in this example here, I've created a opportunity to do lab research for neurological disorders. I am, I have an internal description and an external description. The idea is that I might have some marketing materials that I want to apply to the external description and then post that to our website or maybe to a, a centralized granting website. People can then log in and apply for the grant. I've associated this to a program called International outreach. And then once I start receiving the applications, I can then associate that to my inbound grants. So once I have my funding opportunities set up, I can have, you know, when are, when are we expecting to create the awards? When will the awards need to be completed by? When do we look for applications to be submitted? So again, we have lots of dates that are associated with each of our funding opportunities. So in this case, for my lab research for neurological disorders, I'm going to have Dr. Leonard McCoy apply for that. So that's the, he applied for it. I might have uploaded a sample of the organization as far as the size of the organization and other various fields that I would have on an application form. And that information would be saved along with this letter of inquiry. Then I could go in and create a ranking criteria. You know, what are the, you know, how important is communication skills? How important is the experience? Do a, a weighted average and do kind of a Likert score. And then from there, get a rank total. And I would then have a score for this particular grantee that has applied for my work. With Piango, we can actually make this, this list down here of grantee rankings very customizable. It's really up to whatever organization feels is important. And then you would have kind of like an interview process, right? You would then rank that application. And then again, we can sort it and rank it by different categories. If you're familiar with human resource applications and you're evaluating a new employee or new uh, uh, applicant for a job, it's basically the same process but you're doing that at the organizational level, or again, depending if it's an individual grantee, a professor or faculty member, you might rank individually. Okay, good. So good feedback there. So of course, once we get into the, we awarded a particular amount to a grantee. So again, in this example, I've made the award to American Hospital Supply, and it's again related to this funding opportunity, lab research, it's awarded. When do I start? When do I end? 990 information, all sorts of other attributes I might want to track. I want to track milestones. When are the audit reports due from the grantee? And I want to be able to track that and follow up with them. What are the terms and conditions I might establish for this particular grant? What are the related transactions that are in the system? What kind of expenses have been submitted? What payments have we made to the organization? And then what are my closeout conditions? So, and then again, that can vary potentially on grant by grant. Um, and I might need to establish budgets for the sub awards and be able to track how am I doing against the total budgets and what have I paid out? What budget has not been paid? So this all gets into the direct and indirect cost recovery, but from the flip side. Now in Piango, we also have the ability to do grantee expenses and kind of like a uh, doing a, submitting an expense report for travel, you could have your grantees submit an expense report for whatever expenses they've incurred. And what the way we've implemented it is what's called a non-posting transaction. So it's not impacting your financials directly, but from an audit perspective, you can track all of the expenses that they've made. From here, you could then potentially convert this to an actual invoice or vendor payment, but that would be managed in your normal AP processing. Finally, let me wrap up with some typical metrics where you, ideally you would want to have a dashboard view. I log into my system. Uh, again, this app happens to be a PeopleSoft uh, dashboard, and I want to be able to see what grants am I working on, what are my total grant uh, portfolio picture looking like, so awarded by status here, that's kind of this bar in the middle, 
What are my expenses or my revenue that have have come in? Lists of shortcuts so I can quickly jump into specific either budgets. In this example on the upper right is which grants are related to projects. When I look at a grant, we'll see which transactions are impacting that grant down to either, let's say, payroll, salaries, et cetera, or purchasing vendor bills, et cetera, right? I want to be able to look at kind of a standard income statement uh, report. And of course, it's not necessarily all the PL in the nonprofit world, but a revenue and expense report to show what revenue I've received for these. So in this case, each column represents a different grant. There's my Wounded Warrior Research Grant. What have I received and what have I expensed so far? And break that down in either periods or your days. And I'll wrap up with a common report, the Federal Financial Report, the SF-425. This may look familiar to some of those. A key thing to look at is how much of all we talked about in this past hour and a half, is it automated, right? Can you generate that 425 automatically? Or do you have to export the data in this Excel, fudge the numbers around in Excel, and then type in the numbers into the form, right? You want to avoid that type of process. Tango, just to uh, kind of wrap up here, we have over 50 customers using our uh, nonprofit solutions, wide variety of different types of organizations, faith-based, community-based, international organizations. Millions of dollars are under management uh, through all of these grants. Thousands of grants are being managed across the board. 